I'll see you later. See you later. Bye, love. In May 1982, a woman was raped at her home in Manchester. It was the sixth attack in what was to turn out to be a series of rapes and sexual assaults that was to span seven years. The attacks bore a hallmark. The intruder always surprised his victims in the early morning. Between 1981 and 1984, there were 14 attacks spanning the three counties of Greater Manchester, Lancashire and Cheshire. When the police realised they were linked, they set up a joint inquiry. But despite months of detailed detective work, there were few clues. Then, in February 1984, the attacks stopped. Faced with very little evidence, the cases remained unsolved. Eventually, the police closed their inquiry. What detectives could not have known was that over three years later, the rapist would strike again. GMR News. From the BBC, at 5 o'clock, Rogers Summerskill reporting. Police are hunting a man who raped a 23-year-old woman at her home in Hindley. The man, who was armed with a knife, kicked in the back door of the house and attacked the woman at 10 o'clock this morning. Please say the All forensic evidence from crimes like this throughout the whole of northwest England is sent to labs at Chorley. It was scientists who were to recognise the grim significance of this new attack. The main reason that we thought this was a possible continuation of the earlier series was that it had two distinctive characteristics. That is, it took place in the morning and it took place in a terraced house. Actually, that was a remarkable deduction, given that the labs had dealt with a thousand sexual crimes in the intervening years. But they put their theory to the test. Semen samples from the latest rape at Hindley were analysed to find the telltale blood group. It was A, just as in the previous rapes. Then a further test on enzymes revealed another similarity. Only one in nine males would share this chemistry. Is that the locker today then? It is, yes. Is your daughter still going to the disco later? Yeah, tonight. Yeah. Right. I'll see you later then. Yeah, bye. Yeah. This is Warrington, 20 miles from the attack at Hindley, and two weeks later. The schoolgirl on her morning paper round was saved by a passerby. Can you just go through it very slowly now? Once you disturb this guy, which way did which, which, which way did seem straight to go? Up the back and turn right. Down the alley right. here yeah. and turn right. So it definitely didn't go left. He went right. No, he went right. A scarf or a mask or something around his face. Uh, what part uh, of the face was it covering? Just, just bottom part of it. All of it. No, bottom part of his face. Good morning, Mr. Brown. This detective, Will Brown, had worked on the earlier rapes, and the scene here struck him as familiar. He recalled that two paper girls had been attacked before amidst that series of breakfast time assaults. And I was convinced in my own mind that this was the rapist, that after three years he was back in the northwest of England, and I made my, my feelings known about that. Will Brown's persuasiveness, together with the forensic evidence, provoked fears that a new campaign of rape had just begun. And there's very little finesse about the way he makes his entry to the houses. He simply puts his shoulder or his boot to the rear door uh, and goes in and attacks the woman. Jim Patterson of Manchester Police set up a major inquiry, based at Lee and eventually embracing Lancashire, Cheshire and the regional crime squad. No sooner had it been established than there were two more rapes, at Prestwich and at Hyde. Since these again were in the early morning, the inquiry was named after a bird of prey that strikes at dawn, Operation Osprey. You must realise that at that stage we didn't have any suspect whatsoever uh, that we could look at closely. So what we had to do is compile a composite description and composite information from all the offences that had been committed. And how about his clothing? Could you tell what clothing he was wearing? Jeans. Remember, don't 
In fact, they re-interviewed each victim to cross-check each description. By combining evidence, they hoped to build up a consensus, a consistent picture of one man. And how about on his face? Was there any facial hair or anything that you would, would be very distinctive? His eyes. The M.O. of suspects, that is the method of operation employed by known sex offenders, was cross-checked on the computers. There were 4,000 men with records for sexual crimes in northwest England. But it was technology of a different sort that caused a breakthrough. The introduction, at just this time, of genetic fingerprinting. DNA profiling became available in 1987. It was not available for the earlier series of rapes up to 1984. This is the result that we got from the Hendley Rape. A series of bands, each representing DNA of a particular size. This sample is from another individual, just for comparison, and it can be seen at a glance that the two samples are quite different. We then got the result from the Hyde Rape, and the bands correspond exactly throughout the sequence. The probability of two men having the same profile would be 600 million to one. But the early morning crimes went on. Rochdale, October 1987. In the kitchen on the floor was um, a handbag turned upside down with all the contents strewn on the floor. But, and then I, I began to walk up the stairs and as I got halfway up the stairs I could see uh, the bedroom was in a state, uh, sheets and covers everywhere. But it still didn't sink in, oh, we've been robbed, but nothing, there was no physical marks. And then, then she said he, he raped me. And then we just both, um, we just both uh, sort of broke up, sort of thing. I was extremely concerned. It meant that this man was continuing with the, a new series it, it was building up and it was clear that it was going to, to continue and go on and on. And on and on it went. But at the scene of one of the crimes, a small find turned out to be a big discovery. Uh, then I'll start, just have a look under these covers and I'll start stripping the bed. Ah, gold bracelet, David. Under the duvet. Check whether that belongs to the AP or not, and then uh, if it isn't, of course, it's going to be the offenders. Armed it's with this new evidence and worried by what was the fifth rape uh, in two months, police decided to embark on an appeal. I could say to the public, here is a man who leaves his house early in the morning, who's about 30 years of age, who's about six foot tall, who has dark hair, and who has recently lost this gold bracelet. Please tell me who he is. They believe that he leaves his home or his workplace at about 6 in the morning. For the attacks tend to happen between 6.30 and 9 a.m. The biggest lead the police now have is a gold bracelet found at the scene of a recent attack. It is a nine carat gold half hour gun. It's made up of half of a watch. Leave that with me. I'll get on to you and get all the background information. After the press conference, it just went uh, crazy, really. Uh, everybody was phoning in. Uh, it uh, just went daft. It was like throwing a switch, really. Just everybody called. Good evening. What's the incident, Two of the calls that evening were crucial, and by chance, both were taken by this detective. Well, you don't need to give your name if you, uh, if you don't want to. It, uh, it will be treated in confidence, I can assure you. The caller, who wouldn't give his real name, said he was sure he knew the owner of the yes, bracelet. Uh, it was found at the scene of one of the rapes. Um, this man, is, a, is he a close friend of yours? Yeah. Presswich Hospital, two o'clock. Shall we say the gates of Presswich Hospital? We'll see you tomorrow. That looks like him over there. Freddy? Hi. Uh, do you want to get in? All right. 
thanks for meeting us. Well, I'm Dave McDermott from Lee. This is one of the lads. Yeah, well, I wouldn't have bothered you normally, but I think I know this fellow that you're looking for. What have you got to tell us? Well, I know this bloke in this pub, right? Like. Which pub's that? Well, it's some pub in Salford. But, er, uh, he's got this bracelet, and I saw his bracelet on TV last night. It was like his pride and joy. Uh -huh. Sometimes he pawned it, but he always got it back. And the other day I noticed it was missing, and when I said, where's your bracelet gone, he said that he'd lost it. Lost it or pawned it again? Well, he said that he'd lost it. A bit suspicious, that. He's a bit of a weird bloke anyway, you know, he's always picking fights with people and causing trouble. Can we identify him? What's his name? He's called Andy. Has he been in trouble with the police before? Yeah, for robbing and burglary and stuff. And why do you want to throw him in? Because I don't go in for this raping business. He might go for my missus or something. Do you know where he lives? Yeah, he lives in Swinton. Yeah, the one that was um, depicted tonight with the... The second caller of the night was a policeman, now retired, an officer whose contribution turned out to be extraordinary. A full 14 years ago, he'd become absorbed in a case of an 18-year-old he'd helped to prosecute for burglary and sexual assault. He was alerted and intrigued the detectives he'd invited round by the fact that each offence had been committed in the early morning. Hello, I'm Sergeant Walters. This is DC Dale. Oh. Come to see you. Yeah. I kept his photograph by accident initially. It was stuck in one of my suit pockets. And when I eventually went in this coat pocket and found the photographs, I couldn't bring myself to throw them away. They've been on the shelf in my wardrobe for 14 years. I saw his photograph nearly every day when I went to my wardrobe. I just knew sooner or later you were going to do something. I just felt that he was going to attack women again. His, it was his eyes that struck me. He looked, he looked dangerous to me. When I saw the news on television showing the towns where the offences had been committed, I realised that there must be somebody that lives in the middle of them. The person that came to mind again was Andrew Longmire. Andrew Longmire. Now, Sergeant McDermott, you've seen somebody this morning, haven't you, uh, who's given the name Andrew. Is this going to be the same fella? We've been to see the informant, Freddie, and from what he tells us of Andy, it, uh, and our inquiries down at Salford and then at Records Office, it would appear to be the same Andrew Longmire. Well, obviously, this is a man we want to concentrate on today, I think. I want to know everything we can about his background. This was the first line of inquiry that I was quite optimistic about. Here we had a, a man who clearly fitted the description, we were able to check up on his uh, previous record and we could say that he had been in prison during 1985 when the offences were not being committed but probably more importantly for us we were able to very quickly confirm that he was never in prison when offences were being committed. Dave Craig. Immediately Andrew Longmar's house in Swinton acquired a new neighbour a detective in the bedroom opposite. Yes, yeah, stand by. The postman has just walked up the path towards the front of uh, the HA. Yes, yes, understood. Surveillance is often boring, and this one was especially tedious. Eventually, it looked as though the house might be deserted, and they decided to go in and take a look. Come on, it's the police. Open up. Come on, open the door. It's the police. Oh, it's got the empty look right from the you Clear on there, Craig. 
Is that here, boss? You have five. British gas. Bill. Three diaries, Craig, um, and two telephone address books, miscellaneous letters. Excuse us off the bed, boss. Oh, fine. Is that the, that's the main bed? Main bed books there, yeah. Fine. Leave them there with Craig and you can, uh, you can log them there, please. Okay. We received a sheet, a bed sheet from Longmire's house, and we detected semen stains on it. And again, this was sent for DNA profiling. And the result showed that the bands corresponded exactly with the bands we had obtained from both the Hyde and the Hindley Rape. This discovery was kept secret, but Andrew Longmire now had to be the rapist. He wasn't known to any member of the inquiry team, so what we had to do was make inquiries amongst people that did know him to try to build up a kind of a picture of the man. And it quickly emerged that uh, he was a man who, who was a heavy drinker. There are varying estimates of how much you used to drink in a day, uh, and they range from something in the region of 15 pints up to as many as 30 pints in one day. He was regularly involved in fights with other people. And the general impression that he wasn't very well liked. MDC Brown, this is Tony Raby from Operation Osprey. We're making inquiries in the local pubs to see if uh, anybody knows this man. That's the man we're interested in. It's a fairly good likeness of him. Uh, I'm just wondering if you've seen him in the pub at all at any time. No, 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 I've not, not recognised him at all. His face doesn't ring a bell. Yeah? We're from the police. Can we have a word with you a minute? I know you, yeah. What the bloody hell do you want? Are you a mate of Andy Longmire's? What want him here. We want a word with you. Making some inquiries into a man called Andrew Longmire. We believe you know him. That might do. What's it to you? Oh, we need to they did to find some of Andrew Longmire's criminal associates, though most were reluctant to talk. Yeah. But they wanted to be rid of the police, and they also shared with the detectives a revulsion against rape. Like he says, we're investigating serious offences. Do you mind if we come and talk to you? No. For two weeks, police kept vigil on the house and eventually a neighbour told them Andrew Longmire's girlfriend had been on the phone to them. When she heard police had searched the place, she said she'd come home to talk to them. Detectives picked her up when she arrived and took her in for questioning. Their questions went on for two days. We need to trace Andy urgently. You know him better than anyone else. You're nearer to him than any other person. You live together as man and wife for a number of years. You've got his daughter and we need to know where he is and where is he. I don't think at any time that she knew anything in relation to the sexual offences that he was committing. But when he doesn't do that sort of thing, when he goes out, he goes out robbing. He's not doing anything else. It just coincides that when all the publicity was put out in relation to the sexual offences, that you went away on holiday, you upped all of a sudden and went away. Now, what was the reason for that? Going on holiday. He did some burglary or something and the bloke came back and hit him over the heads and, you know, that's why we went, keep things quiet. Did you believe him? Well, my initial reaction obviously was that she did know and that she had to know. Um, she was living with the man, she'd lived with him for years. But as I came to know Pat, uh, it was obvious to me that she'd absolutely no idea whatsoever that he was committing these offences. Now, the aggrieved girls in both those cases say that the person who raped them had a scarf around the lower part of his face and around his neck. Now, from us speaking previously, you know and I know that when Andy's turned out in the morning to do, as you say, his robberies, he's worn a scarf, hasn't he, when he's gone out? I know, I know. I understand what you're saying, but I just I can't believe it's him. Well, they also talk about him having a knife, as do the other people that have been attacked. And we know that Andy always carries a knife. You said that, and we've learned that from the inquiries that we've made. I know. But I just can't believe... Take the offence at Hindley. The back door kicked in. 
a woman in the house on her own, a pillowcase put over her head. Can I speak to Sue on my own, please? Okay, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay. the matter, Pat? Them things, he started doing them to me. To you as well? Yeah. Pat told them of the inn in Ludlow and other places where she'd stayed with Andrew while they'd been on the run together. It turned out the hotelier here remembered Andrew Longmire well and had good reason to. Can I, uh, can I have a family room, please? How long would you like it for? Two nights. When he came to stay initially, it was casually dressed, casual appearance. We asked for a family room for him, his wife and child. Do you want some help with your bag? No, it's okay, I got it. Bang a bit, please, and have one yourself. Oh, thanks very much. On a Saturday night, I usually come down to the bar early to get everything ready. And as I was coming down the corridor, I could hear a soaring noise from that bedroom. Yeah, I wondered what, the, what on earth was going on. Pictures in your mind of soaring furniture, making a mess over the bedroom, whatever. Next morning, he went into the room to have a look. No shavings, no nothing. I had absolutely no idea what they may have been doing. In fact, there'd been a burglary in Ludlow. Though police didn't know it, Andrew Longmire was now armed with a sawn-off shotgun. Roger, we'll investigate. One month later, late at night, at Leeds in Yorkshire. This is a lady's toilet. She shouldn't be in here. Come on out, please. I'll just get my gear. What's all this about? I haven't done anything wrong. Well, I'll tell you what it's about. That was a lady's toilet you were in. You frightened a lady who wanted to use those toilets. He shouldn't have been in there. Didn't know it was a lady's toilet. Can I have a name and uh, date of birth? John C. Mark. I was born 12th of May 1956 in Wrexham. Have you got anything to confirm this, like a uh, driving license or anything? No. Where are you going? Well, I was on my way to York. A body check on A1, John C. Mark. That's Sierra Echo. I missed my connection, so I have to stay here. I'm waiting for the next train. My car's in Arrogate, you see. Well, if you want to sit down in here, I'll find out the times of the trains for you. Guest received of your description. Six foot scruffy. He was quite stocky as well. Over. Stand by. Charlie Fox drop three to control. Can you do me a PNC check, please? On a red marina. Gold. Next day, Charlie police Gold. checked the station car park in Harrogate. The there was just a possibility the gunman's story about having left a car there might be true. A lot of gear in here, Sarge. Oh, I'll better have a look then. 
We'll have these. What's this? It was a small ad in a newspaper from Exeter. An advert for a red marina, just like the one in which the paper had been found. Good morning. It's the police at Manchester here. I'm making inquiries in relation to a vehicle that you've advertised in, in your local paper. It was indeed the same car, and it was covered with Andrew Longmire's fingerprints. Are you able to tell me, then, who you've sold the vehicle to? Well, it's an, it's an inquiry we're doing in Manchester in some very serious offences. What's more, Andrew Longmire's hallmark was discovered where the car was bought in Devon. Early one morning in Exeter, there'd been an attempted rape on a woman in a terraced house. There'd also been some burglaries in the same terrace, and a footprint had been found. Photographs were sent to the forensic labs at Chorley and matched against the trainers found in Andrew Longmire's car. There was no doubt it was the same sh A fortnight later in Blackburn, Lancashire. We went to see the girl in hospital after, about two or three hours after she'd been raped at her home. She was obviously very, very distressed about what had happened, but also very calm and very, very cooperative. She'd been stabbed. The main wound was to the back, um, which had actually punctured her lung, uh, which she still suffers from some chest complaint now. Uh, she'd also got quite a, a serious stab wound to the left-hand side of her neck. Um, various what we call defence wounds to her hands where she'd actually tried to grab the knife. The violence was of a level not known before from Andrew Longmire and the police were becoming increasingly anxious and frustrated at their inability to find him. <coughs> morning, sir. Morning. Um, what it is, early this morning... DNA samples sent from the rape here at Blackburn would take six weeks to process, but evidence connecting Longmire to the stabbing was discovered at a scrapyard 200 metres from where the crime had been committed. A man like Longmire had bought a van here half an hour before the rape. I'll take it. Right. What the man noticed about him was that he was a very cool customer and he didn't like the man from first setting eyes on him. The buyer had worn sunglasses, and the victim told police she remembered seeing a man who wore dark glasses shortly before she'd been attacked. She was certain he was her assailant. Any final doubts were quickly swept aside. Fingerprints at a local hotel, where a man in dark glasses had been staying, were those of Andrew Longmire. Now his violence was becoming more savage. Operation Osprey launched a second nationwide appeal. They asked for a great blaze of publicity. Next, Manchester police need your help to find a man who could be anywhere in the country. His name is Andrew Longmire, although he uses a number of aliases. We knew that he was staying in small hotels, and I hoped that that same night we would receive a phone call telling us where he was. Uh, I also knew, of course, that if it didn't work, and the danger was he'd be turned into a much more desperate man than he had been previously. Police have taken the unusual step of naming Longmire because of what they describe as the escalating level of violence used in the sexual attacks over the past few months. Now they know he has a gun and he's threatened to use it. They say they can't take any chances. These warnings were a gamble. Labelling this man as dangerous might jeopardise a trial and would undermine much of the identification evidence police had been so patiently gathering from victims. While we were on the air last time, we had quite a lot of calls on this Andrew Longmire character. Any more news on that? A marvellous response. Well over 70 calls, and that's here in the studio. The information has provided a lot of sightings. We had uh, people and other forces 
working for us all night and over the next few days. It was a dangerous situation because we never knew which one might be the right call. Good evening, madam. Sorry to trouble. And I would have to pay tribute to the, the officers in my force and in other forces who had to simply knock on doors, never knowing who was going to answer it. Uh, and always with the knowledge in their own minds that they could be faced by a man who was quite likely to shoot them. Well, it was very frustrating uh, not being able to find him. We had a team of officers who were dedicated to, to tracking him down, and we always seemed to be one step behind him. When you were off, your eyes would be open and you'd be looking around and not really concentrating on what you're supposed to be doing. And uh, that situation applied when you came in in the morning. You used to think, I wonder what he did last night or where he stayed last night. In fact, at Stoke, there was another rape. Then weeks dragged by. It's January 1988 on Merseyside. Two unsuspecting officers were on routine patrol. Looks like he's had a few too many. Okay. I can't have a word. Hello, mate. It's the police. You all right? What are you doing here? I'm waiting for a mate. Yeah, where do you live? I live over there. What's the address? Uh, I don't know. I've just woken up. I can't remember. Um... All right. What's your name, mate? John C. Mark. John. What's your card, John? Golf Romeo 4-1. Can you run a vehicle check for me, please? Uh, Been round here somewhere? Yeah. That's a white Datsun registered in Yorkshire. Roger. Have you got any identification? Yeah, I've got okay. a license. Jesus! No, don't! No! Ken! stage he tried to get up off the trolley of course he was handcuffed to the trolley with both hands two sets of handcuffs um that didn't stop him he stood up and tried to walk out of the hostel with the, with the trolley on his back and he had us contempt for everyone around him we didn't know who he was until we got to the hospital and uh checks were made and it was revealed to be Andrew Longmore. The night before, it was read out to us uh, when we came on that he'd been seen in the Wrexham area. I commented at the time that, oh, he's getting a bit close now, we'll start to start looking for him. And uh, little did we know that night that we would be uh, fighting with him the, the following day. But, uh, I think we were both very lucky. I was at home in bed in the early hours of the morning when my telephone uh, rang. Uh, it was my deputy, Superintendent McNichol, who, who told me that uh, there had been an incident at Bevington in the Wirral and uh, that two uh, police officers had been shot at. I, in my semi-sleepy state, thought he said two officers had been shot. And I've got to say that that was probably the worst moment uh, in my career 
Uh, I thought that my decision at that stage had caused two officers to be seriously injured. The man who police cannot name for legal reasons was brought here to Birkenhead Police Station after receiving medical treatment. He'll be taken by officers of Greater Manchester Police to Lee Police Station, headquarters of Operation Osprey. Morning. I knew immediately that I saw him, that this was the man, the man that we've been uh, looking for night and day, the man that had taken over your life for a good number of weeks, actually. I just looked at him and I told him who I was and he, uh, he just looked up and it, it was as if he was looking at someone that he knew as well. I felt with the, uh, the number of enquiries we'd done about him, all the background, that I was looking at someone that I'd, I'd known for a long time and I'd never even seen him previously. And he just looked at me and he just said, yeah, it's been a long road, hasn't it? Do you know Oldham? Yeah. But you're saying you can't remember committing an offence there? Yeah. Just let me give you a few details. The offence happened in 1983. Now, I appreciate 1983 is a long time ago. It was on a Wednesday morning. It was 8.30 a.m. And it was in mid-January, the yeah. 18th of January. Yeah, look, I'll finish that one for you. I went into the house and then I raped her. And when I left, I stole a sovereign ring. I always believed that when we, when we got him in, it would be a situation where he sat there and, and wouldn't speak at all. However, by, by keep going over the same routine, over the same questions, eventually he started to come across. Myself and uh, DC Dyer, the other interviewing officer, we used to see him first thing in the morning. We used to sort of settle him down and uh, we would talk about all manner of things. I didn't sleep too well. The solicitors arrived in and we were in a situation where we, we needed to get inside the man. We wanted that man to be talking to us and we were always striving to get him to say more than he was actually saying on the interview. Does that incident ring any bells with you? No. As far as I can remember, I never raped anyone in Wigan. There'd been so many rapes, these interviews went on for three weeks, the detectives anxious to get confessions for the 14 attacks that preceded the genetic fingerprinting. They wanted to clear up the crimes and, for the sake of the victims, to close those dreadful episodes as best they could. Did you have a knife with you at that stage? Yes, yes, I always have a knife. Even when I go to the pub, I have a knife. All the other matters that we've spoken about, the sexual offences, has there always been a knife? I can't remember. I can't remember. I don't know. I don't know. He didn't show remorse in relation to the, to the victims. Uh, he was very annoyed at getting himself caught. <laughs> Several of the women described the eyes of the offender as being very penetrating, very piercing, ice cold. The victims must have been absolutely terrified. We did actually move because of it. It's always in the back of your mind that you moved because you didn't want to move. Someone made you move and it hurts knowing that you had to leave your house and your home and your neighbours and your friends because of some maniac.